Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Adam, we totally forgot to mention, we are now in our third year of the podcast, episode 106 tonight. So thank you to everyone who has been listening since the start, or if you're coming on late, we really appreciate all the feedback that we've gotten. And certainly we enjoy doing this because of, you know, contributing back to the community. So thank you to all our listeners for a successful two years and hopefully too many more. So starting our third year this year. It's incredible. Uh, I remember starting this in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of people started podcasts then because it was a great thing to do when you're kind of stuck in your house and can only talk to people online. And the one thing I didn't want us to do was record like six episodes and give up on it. Wanted us, if we were going to do this, we're going to stick with it. And one of the things I'm most proud of, Andy, you mentioned this is episode 106. So two full years plus another two weeks, we've released a new episode every week. Now, it's not always been easy because one of us has been out, you know, vacation or can't record for whatever reason, and we've always found a way to make it work so that there was new content every single week. And that's that's real dedication. Um, it's, I mean, I'm not asking for a medal or anything, but, you know, we, we do um, record multiple episodes in a night or we record on weeknights or, or other abnormal times just to make sure we always have something ready to go every single Sunday. And it's been a real pleasure, like Andy said, to hear from the community and and maybe give back in our own small way. It's a business that never stops changing. And thankfully we've never had to worry about running out of things to talk about because uh, that was another concern early on. And I think Andy's got a list a mile wide of topics we could talk about. And then before we even get to some of those evergreen topics, you know, there's always some some breaking news to cover as well. So I don't worry about us running out of things to talk about anytime soon. It's been a wild ride. Thanks for listening and looking forward to tonight's conversation. What do we have, Andy? So we're going to start off with someone that I follow on Twitter and LinkedIn. His name is Heath Adams. He's a great person. He's a veteran. He is a founder for TCM Security. And they're an education company. They're a good alternative to the certified ethical hacker through EC Council. If you don't like that particular certification, TC Secu- TCM Security has their own practical network penetration, penetration tester certification, PNPT. And it's a very good certification. It's very cost effective. So I follow him and he is a pen tester. And so he posted that he was doing an internal pen test and he was able to get domain admin in a very unique way. And I wanted to walk through his post because I think it's always valuable for defenders to understand how attackers are successful. That way we can get better at defending and vice versa too. So the organization that he was up against had a bunch of mixed security So he said that they could perform something called LLMNR, which is Link Local Multicast Name Resolution Poisoning. We won't talk about that specifically this episode, but we'll dive deeper into that particular method of attack at a later episode. But having done that, they already captured 50 or so hashes and cracked about 50% of those. So... Some metrics that we looked up, actually, because one of the things we'll talk about tonight is Kerberosting, and that does require cracking passwords and hashes. Adam and I looked up how um, how long it takes to crack a password using, like, a modern GPU, like the RTX 3090. And if you're using a very old password policy, or if you have Surface accounts or accounts that haven't had their password changed in many, many years and are still following the old eight-character NIST standard, today's 
GPUs can crack that in about 39 minutes, even if it's complex, if it's upper, lower numbers, symbols. An eight-character password is 39 minutes using a modern GPU, and that's not even like multiple GPUs. We're just talking one GPU. So not very secure. So in this case, they've already cracked about 50% of those. None of the users that they cracked had local admin rights, so it made lateral movement very difficult. So it eliminated a lot of the relay attacks like SMB relays, IPv6, unless they were able to catch a domain admin account in action, which they didn't. The organization also used LAPS, had decent enterprise AV, and was using a really expensive EDR. Their patching was super strong. There were no default credentials being used anywhere. There were no fancy attacks in play like Petit Potum, No Pact, Print Nightmare, Sand the Admin. Everything was patched. And there were no service accounts to Kerberos. We're going to dive into Kerberos in a little bit, but this is important here that they did scan for this and that there were no service accounts to Kerberos. Overall, it was a timed engagement, so they had a limited time to figure out if they could get domain admin. So it came down to finding a needle in a haystack or getting an admin count to relay via IPv6. And he said he found the needle. And here's the walkthrough. One of the cracked accounts had an overly permissive access to the file shares. And then they were able to see the user's personal shared folders. Within the share folder of a domain admin, there was a computer setup instruction document. And within that, it contained a local admin password. They were using LAPS, but he was like, well, one could hope. And so he used CrackMap XE to spray the password across the network, and it was successful on one machine, just one. And he used secret stumps on that machine, and there was a domain admin account in clear text. It was being used as a service. The password was stored in the registry, and he was able to log into the domain controller using that. So... Overall, again, kind of similar to what we talked about last week with Uber. I mean, it was just like one thing and they were in. So this came down to a computer setup instruction with a password and clear text. And he only had to get it to work on one computer. And he was very lucky that within that computer, there was a domain admin account that's being used as a service. So I just thought it was really interesting how he did it. Um, and then, you know, part of it was that he scanned accounts to Kerberos. And then I wanted to talk about what Kerberos roasting was because I didn't really know. So I looked it up and I'm <laughs> going to educate everybody on it. That walkthrough for those of you who love a good analogy reminds me of Texas Hold'em. And there's this concept where if you have a hand where you, you have three of the five cards you need to make a hand. And so the, the fourth community card or, or the turn and the fifth community card or the river, both are the cards you need. It's called going runner runner. And it's not something you should try to do because the odds are so poor against it. Usually what happens is it, it happens like a newbie. It happens against you where somebody should have laid down their hand, but they kept it and they go runner runner and then beat you in a way. So for example, maybe somebody was holding part of a straight flush, you know, maybe they had um, the four five, six of hearts and then the turn is the seven of hearts and then the rivers, the eight of hearts. So they went runner runner to get a straight flush and beat you. Um, that'd be super frustrating, right? That's like almost what this is here. Like this isn't like, oh, look at you know how bad your security is or anything. They went like runner runner to get a <laughs> like three times. It was runner runner runner. Uh, get one document that had a local admin password in it. Spray and find it on one computer where it's still being used, and then that computer has domain admin in clear text. Like you didn't. I mean they did the work and like they found a way to get there, which is what attackers will do. I'm not being dismissive of this, but like this is not endemic bad security at all. In fact, this is really good security. And I guess Andy, to your point, it just shows you like you only need one thing to go wrong and, and then they can almost get to the keys of the kingdom. Sometimes this is honestly like almost a Hollywood story for security professionals. That's crazy. So I mentioned that 
they did scan to see if any service accounts were Kerber roastable. And what is Kerber roasting? So I didn't know what this is, and I thought, let's learn about it because it is definitely an attack that can happen today, and there are things that you can do to mitigate against it. So it is a technique that an attacker, once they're inside your environment, they can try to pack, crack the password of a service account within Active Directory. Very important that they already need to have access to your environment in order to do this. This is a post-exploitation technique, right? This is not a vulnerability, although it does kind of exploit how the architecture of AD is, but that's not something that we can fix today. I mean, that's just an architectural design that is probably flawed at this point, but it was designed many, many years ago with, you know, not this in mind. And so either through a vulnerability or phishing attack, the attacker gets a compromised domain user. You have to have a domain user in order for this to work. They scan AD for user accounts with SPN values set and admin account equals one. This can be done either via PowerShell or LDAP queries using scripts in Kerber roasting tools like PowerSploit. Once target accounts are found, if they do find any accounts with those SPN values set, the attacker can then request a service ticket from AD using the SPN values with tools like Ghostpacks, uh, Rubius, and then the ticket contains an encrypted password or Kerberos. The attacker will extract the service tickets and hashes to a, the memory using tools like Mimikatz and save that information to a file. And then the attacker brute forces that password offline using like Hashcat or John the Ripper. And so it's really hard to detect because there's no domain traffic there's no user lockouts because they're brute forcing that hash offline and as we mentioned you know adam as soon as he saw this when we were talking through this in the pre-notes he was like well wait a minute you got to brute force this offline like how long is that going to take that could take a long time yeah it can if you're using like a 32 character you know non um you know completely random password for sure that that's not brute forceable but if you're using, and I mentioned, you know, AD, this is, you have service accounts that are probably, number one, passwords never expired. Number two, could be years or even decades in use that the passwords never change because they're service accounts. And if you change the password, that can break the service. And so, you know, very much like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Many people are very, very conscious of not changing service account passwords and so this is uh this is very doable if if you're not doing very good account hygiene and so once they brute force the password then they have the password and then they can use that account and move laterally find a, a, an account with privilege and escalate from there and, and so on and so forth so um it's really dangerous because number one most traditional cybersecurity tools are not designed to monitor or analyze behavior of approved users, right? Once they have that password and it's a, it's a, a credential that they is valid, your security tools generally don't pick up on that, right? They're logging in as a valid user. It's almost never designed to, to look for those sorts of things. And because there's no malware deployed, there's no other like, you know, fishy at activity going on there's nothing to pick up right they're using a, a valid spn value to get a kerberos ticket then they brute force it offline there's no trace of it and then they're logging in with a valid user after that the other thing is it doesn't require a domain admin account or even one that has elevated privileges it just needs a domain user so any account that can request a service ticket can be used in this attack. So a lot of really bad things. It's really dangerous, really hard to detect, which is why it's still being used today. So how do you protect against this? So number one, you got to find your Kerber roastable possible targets. And how do you do that? You do it the same way that the attackers actually do it. You scan your accounts to see if there's anything using that SPN value. So 
You can do this with no third-party tools, just using DS Query, which is built into Windows Server since 2008, or from installing RSAT tools. Once you have that, you can use two options. Um, it, once you have the accounts, right, if, once you're scanning for their, those kerberos targets. So I, I'm not going to like list the particular command. You can, we'll, we'll post some documentation in the show notes, but you can look for this to s- figure out what the DS query is to find your targets. Once you have those targets, let's say you do have kerberos service accounts. Like best case scenario, you don't have any like in this pen test, he didn't find any, right? If you didn't have any, great, awesome. But if you do, you have really two options. You can either clear out the service principal name attribute, that SPN value, or you can give that user an uncrackable password, right? If you have a longer password, they, it, it'll be too long to brute force, right? Both are valid, but a couple of things because you might break things. In order to avoid breaking things, you have to verify that the host and the service listed for the attribute for that user account either do not exist or are no longer in use, right? So if you have that SPN value, but that account is being used, great. Just clear out the value and you're good. If they are still in use, you can transition the service to use the host account or computer account, not a user account. This attack only use, works for user accounts that can request a Kerberos ticket. So if, it, if you're transitioning the service to run as system and handle the authentications that way, there's nothing to Kerberos, right? There's no user to authenticate anymore. It's just the host. So transition it to the host if you can. Host-based SPNs are not vulnerable to Kerberosing attacks. It's usually a complex key that is refreshed every 30 days. There is no password. So transition it to a host-based SPN versus a user-based SPN. Most user SPN accounts are selected by humans. And so usually, you know, they pick some easy password and that they can remember. And that's why we have this attack. The other option is to give that user account an uncrackable password. And if you do that, then you need to make sure that you reconfigure everything that's using that. So the biggest issue is if you have a ton of Kerberosable users, you'll need to prioritize your efforts based on the risk of each one, which service is most vulnerable and which one is um, most important to your company. So that is something that can be an issue if you're in a large organization and you run this query and all of a sudden you have a couple hundred user accounts that are Kerberosable, that would be a bad thing. You can use tools that can automate it. Um, For example, like Bloodhound Enterprise, which is an AD query tool that attackers often use, actually. There's a lot of EDR tools that will detect against Bloodhound. Um, but they have an enterprise internal blue team tool that you can use to basically automate changing the passwords for multiple Kerberos to bowl accounts. So look into that. Um, but yeah, that's all uh, a few things that you can do to remediate that once you have that scan. This is really interesting. Just like you said, not a vulnerability, but, uh, post exploitation tactic or whatever you want to call it. Um, I had always heard about this, but didn't know how it actually worked. And yes, we did have that conversation kind of in the pre-show about cracking passwords. And, you know, a couple of the points you made to me as well, Andy, were that given how long active directory has been around, it debuted 23 years ago. It is possible that some of these passwords are extremely old and aligned to, security principles that we no longer subscribe to today. So the passwords might be far less complex than we would expect a modern password to be. And so with that, that that would make them pretty easily crackable. If you can dump some of these hashes offline and go to town, you could find some hits and the more Kerberosable accounts you have, the more likely the, the bad guys will find something. And so at least there's good mitigations in place. It is possible to mitigate it. You heard that pen test where they found no 
Hacker Roastable account, so it is possible. And other orgs have eliminated their attack surface in this space. So that's a North Star for anybody listening who hasn't done the work yet. It is possible. So cool stuff here. Do we have anything else, Andy? Yeah, I mean, there's other protections, obviously. Like oh, if you, yeah, if you have um, a user account, right? If if they're have MFA enabled, that makes it less likely that the attacker can get access to the environment. Um, hopefully, you have some sort of MFA for your VPN or anything like that. But you know, that's one of the mitigations. Um, you should identify any privileged service accounts. I always was very cautious when we got a new product in at you know companies that I worked at and they're like yes we need a service account with global admin rights we need a service account with domain admin rights it's like do you really need that like exactly what permissions do you need you know so it's very rare that services actually need to run as domain admin it's usually the easy button but Mm -hmm. I'm almost 99% sure that the majority of products that you buy can be scoped to specific permissions rather than just giving them the domain admin button. Right. And then you can also use groups managed service accounts, GM essays, which have random complex passwords that are automatically rotated and centrally managed within AD. So those, a lot of companies use user accounts as service accounts. But you can use GMSAs, which is the equivalent to like service principles. If you're familiar with Azure and the cloud side, service principles are accounts that cannot be logged into. They run a service. So there's no authentication for like a user. There's no MFA. It just runs as a service. So um, yeah, transition to GMSAs. I mean, they've been around for a long time. They're not too difficult to work. They do require... Um, some configuration on the AD side in order to get it to work, but you can easily use those to run your services rather than a user account. Mm -hmm. Those are some other mitigations that you can have. Anything else to add, Adam? All right. Well, hopefully you guys learned something about curb roasting. I thought there was really interesting to dive into. I didn't know much about it. Like Adam said, you know, this is something we've heard about, but didn't really know. Cause we're not pen testers. We don't really do this type of attack. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always think that it's good to learn about this stuff. Um, so that you know how to defend against it. So that's our show for this week. Thanks as always for listening and watching our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or con- content that you want us to go over or talk about on future shows. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.